We still have people uh, entering into the our event, but it's 12 o'clock, so uh, we'll begin. Tan Chi, everyone, hello and bonjour. Um, I want to begin for us to uh, acknowledge this beautiful day that we've been given and to acknowledge that um, this life that we've been given and to just to take a, a moment just to, to, in our busyness, to just acknowledge the day uh, that we have and this time that we have together. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Orange Shirt Day today. Uh, it's a national day across Canada, honoring the lives of our children, Indigenous uh, children and their families who went to residential school. So acknowledging their resilience and their resistance and just honoring uh, the lives and uh, taking into consideration the impacts of Canada's colonial history. And also balancing that with uh, the beautiful teachings that we still have, such as that we will learn from today. Uh, Mino is Cindy Gadet. I am assistant professor at Campus Saint-Jean here at University of Alberta. I belong to my mémères, my ma tante, uh, my soeur, um, my family, les femmes métif. And so I want to acknowledge all my relations and all, all the relations of, of our land here who continue to be present and take care of our, our spirits and take care of our lives. And I want to acknowledge that beautiful tree in my backyard that received uh, my tobacco offering this morning. So receiving the gifts of the land, receiving the gifts of those uh, teachings that we'll receive from Carrie, and also the gifts of the plants that we'll learn about today. Um, I'd like to extend on behalf of the University of Alberta Sustainability Council a warm welcome to all of you that are joining and still joining. Wow, we have over 280 participants. How fantastic. Today's our first uh, virtual lecture of 2020 on, the, on our ongoing sustainability lecture series. And as some of you may know, the Sustainability Council Lecture Series was launched in the fall of 2019 to provide students, academic staff, and members of the community an opportunity to engage in learning related to the diversity of sustainability issues, topics, and ideas, so many ways to think and rethink sustainability. So this series will continue this year in roughly a bi-weekly format with overarching themes on sustainability, equity and climate change. And the mission is to spark that learning and discovery and active citizenship for sustainability while highlighting local, regional experts, artists, researchers, and academics. Our next lecture, so you know, put in your calendar, will be October 14th, um, over the noon hour with Dr. Farouk Hamez. He's an associate professor in civil engineering at the University of Alberta, and his lecture is titled Increasing Productivity and Reducing Waste. Is Canada ready to apply lean construction? He will address the opportunities for the Canadian construction industry to apply lean construction principles to reduce process waste and increase productivity. So if you want to learn any more about our lectures, please visit our website at uab.ca-sustain. And for today, we have a very special guest, my midship sister, uh, who will be delivering a traditional plant workshop. Uh, her name is Carrie Armstrong. She's a proud Métis woman, a teacher, an award-winning businesswoman that has founded and created Indigenous-themed beauty products and tea products that are accessible across Canada. And it's Carrie's mission to educate Canadians on the beauty of Indigenous culture and contributions made by Indigenous people. Carrie is going to share her teachings today on the Indigenous healing plants and discuss several local plants and their properties and how we can use them at home to make our own teas. She's also going to discuss, which is so important, the protocols that she's been taught in regards to how do we respect Mother Earth when we use these plants? How do we be good relatives? Carrie uh, was born and raised in Alberta. She deeply treasures and attributes much of her inspirations and success from her grandmother's teachings about Aboriginal traditions. 
So following um, 15 years of working in the cosmetic and spa industry, Carrie went back to school. She earned her Bachelor of Education from the University of Alberta. She's taught at the Amuscatchee Academy in Edmonton's Indigenous High School. And the school had a traditional plant garden that Carrie used to create hands-on learning opportunities for her students. So powerful. Seeing the positive reaction from the students was inspiring to her. And she realized she needed to start showcasing the beauty of her culture. These experiences, as well as her backgrounds and aesthetics, was the genesis for her own line of personal care products called Mother Earth Essentials. Please join me in welcoming Carrie Armstrong with us today. Thank you so much, Cindy. It is such an honor to be asked by, by this council and the uni university to be here. So I just want to express my gratitude for that. And um, thanks for the lovely introduction. Um, and we can get right into this. I know there's a lot of people and as we go through this workshop, um, I, I always like doing this in person, of course, in a circle where we can see each other and smell the plants. It's such an important piece, but we're doing it a different way. Um, but we can still ask questions. So feel free to ask questions and we may not get to them all if there's a lot of questions, but we can absolutely get back to you afterwards if we don't have a chance to answer the questions. So um, feel free to interject um, by typing in the chat box your questions. Um, so yes, again, thank you for the introduction. And we're gonna talk about the healing plants um, that the way that I was taught. So um, we'll just move right into the slideshow, please. I don't, oh, there she is. <laughs> we're, we're working this out. I have no control over the slides. So, um, so Cindy did a great, great intro there. Um, I'm a mom, I'm a teacher and the founder of a business called Mother Earth Essentials. And I'm here to talk about the, more about the physical properties. When, when we think of indigenous healing, it is so much more than just herbal remedies, of course. It is um, the teachings of our medicine people and our elders who really understand the, um, the spiritual properties of the plants. And I'm always careful in what I teach because those teachings those really spiritual teachings are um, meant to be taught by our medicine people and our elders. So we're here to talk about some physical properties of the plants that are known, um, that are common, and how to work with them. And again, respecting the protocol. So um, I, I'm not here to talk of those spiritual properties that are really meant for, for our elders and our medicine people to share. So if you know someone you know, it's, it's always important to make those connections um, to our elders and, and talk to them about those spiritual properties. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I wanna start by giving you a bit of my history so you understand who I am and why I'm doing this. And uh, I think Cindy really summed it up nicely. But um, in 2006, I did create a business based on the plant teachings of my grandma. And it, it was a, a long journey of making a whole bunch of mistakes and not understanding or really growing up with the protocol. Um, it was a, a journey of learning for me and still learning from uh, elders that I've worked with and um, just different teachers along the way. So I had a, a lot of education in order to, to do this and made many, many mistakes. So I jumped right in and then got my hand slapped by some elders a few times and had to back up and go, okay, let's get this right. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, I also, during the pandemic, because... Um, there was a demand for tea and Mother Earth Essentials wasn't selling tea at the time. 
was a lot of people at the beginning of the the pandemic were asking me for tea. So we quickly assembled some tea and some packaging and we, so you might see this name. So I just wanted to clarify when I say a sky tea, that's my earth tea that is connected. So just to get that out of the way, I do have that tea as well. So, okay, next slide. Okay, so the information I'm gonna share um, really is for knowledge, I am not a medicine person. I am not here to talk about um, curing, preventing illnesses and diseases. I'm here to share knowledge with you. And um, it's really important to be careful when using some of these plants. The plants can be um, potentially dangerous. The plants can be uh, possibly grown, growing in an area where they've been sprayed with a weed killer or other chemicals. So really important to know for sure what you're picking if you're deciding to go out and pick your own and knowing, um, uh, you know, different things like when, when to pick it. And um, there's certain plants that certain times of year become toxic. So what I'm sharing with you is pretty superficial. We've got a short period of time and we can't get into all the risks and dangers. So please be careful. This is my, my little disclaimer to say, be careful and be safe. Um, so of course, prior to colonization, uh, our ancestors and our medicine people were our original doctors. And this is something that, um, this was the way that we healed. We used the plants for medicines and we've come so far from that over the years. And in the last, you know, um, little bit of time, I've seen such a resurgence of interest in people wanting to learn more about the plants and reconnect with mother earth. And it's, it's really beautiful that people are interested again. And I'm so excited that you're all here today to just see that connection. So, um, when I was teaching, I, I, I think that's where I really saw it. So my grandmother taught me the plants growing up. And it's, it's really interesting that we're doing this today on Orange Shirt Day, which is um, the day that we remember our residential school survivors and the children that were lost and the children that were harmed. And when I was a young girl, my grandmother took me out a lot to uh, teach me about the plants, uh, show me some of the remedies. She would use remedies to um, help us when we were sick. And she always did it very privately. There was no sharing of that knowledge in public. Um, in public, we, we never talked about that stuff. She only did that when she felt safe maybe if we were out picking berries or camping, that she felt safe sharing that knowledge. And I didn't understand why that was until I was much older. And when I was older, I figured out um, that my mom had been in residential school. No one talked about it. Finally, they started talking about it. And she and two of her sisters were in residential school. And it was extremely negative experience. They were severely abused and lived through a lot of trauma. And it also affected my grandmother because it made her afraid to share those teachings and um, she felt the need to keep it private. Um, perhaps thinking that we would also get taken away, I'm not sure, but she kept it very separate. So it was it was that that sort of really sparked my interest in the plants and you know those good memories of her teaching those things and being so happy and positive when she taught it and especially when i found out that this had happened in my family that this residential school abuse directly affected my family um, i really wanted to take her teachings and her knowledge and find a way to um, to share it and find a way to turn it into a more positive, uh, more of a healing um, for our family, 
for the students that I taught. So it really became my mission to find, find ways to share this knowledge. And I wasn't quite sure at first how I would do it. And I guess years in cosmetics was sort of the, the push, right? Not seeing plants like sweetgrass or sage on mainstream cosmetic shelves. Um, working in that industry, I saw many other plants from all over the world, but not our own culture being celebrated here in Canada. Okay, next one. Okay, um, so prior to doing this, we're going to talk a little bit about protocol. And um, we talked about, I said, mentioned it at the beginning, but if we're requesting something from an elder, say you want to learn more about the spiritual properties of the plants, um, the way that I've been taught is to speak to your elder. Um, Cindy made a wonderful offering of tobacco this morning under her, her tree. And um, I thank you for that, Cindy. Um, so whether you're looking for guidance or teachings, prayers, um, to approach the elder and offer tobacco is one way you can do that. And um, I was taught to give um, from your left hand, the side of your heart, so you can give your best. So that's a picture of the elder that I worked with, Mr. Francis Whiskey Jack. And he was instrumental in sort of guiding me along the path when I started this business. So I, I always remember to give thanks to Francis for those teachings. Next. Okay. Um, also, when you're picking, um, a lot of our plants are becoming endangered. And it's such a shame. There's plants become endangered every single day on our planet. And a lot of it's just from over harvesting, um, picking more than, than a person needs. So when picking, there's a lot of plants where you can just pull off some of the leaves. You don't have to pull the whole thing out by the roots. You can just, you know, take what you need. And just taking that moment to give thanks. This is a picture of someone offering tobacco and a, maybe a prayer to Mother Earth before they picked. Um, just as a way to say thank you. And I think it really connects us to our healing more when we take that moment to give thanks and um, really connect. So when I had my store in Edmonton and I was, you know, I had people come in and talk to me and they'd, they'd often want to, you know, come and buy their tea. And some of them, like willow bark, I would always encourage to to pick themselves because there, there's so much willow, especially in our province. I know there's a lot because when you pick your own and you connect that way, I think we're taking more responsibility for our healing and connecting with ourselves and mother earth more. And I, I just feel like that's more, um, just a more holistic approach to healing ourselves instead of running into the store and buying something off the shelf. So, um, it's, it's kind of a nice way to take some of that time in our busy days and our busy schedules to, to do that in a nice, um, uh, meaningful way, I think, by offering that. So, okay, next one. Okay, so what we're going to do today in our very, very limited amount of time um, is we're going to go through a number of plants that have been used for many, many years for healing and medicines and food. Um, talk about how to work with them. Um, these last two bullets say, choose plants that meet your needs and make tea. So typically, pre-COVID, we would gather in person and I would have the jars of tea and we would finish the workshop with blending our own tea to take home. So you have to use your imaginations today because we don't have that. Um, so hopefully pictures um, that I have of the plants is, is all we're gonna have. So 
um, hopefully you've smelled some of these before and you've seen them in real life and you can maybe identify a little bit more about what we're talking about. Okay, next one. Okay, so very first plant we're going to talk about is the blueberry. And this really goes to a lot of berries, whether it's Saskatoon's or um, huckleberries or pretty much any of the berries are high in antioxidants. So meaning that they neutralize harmful free radicals linked to a lot of age-related diseases, um, heart health, eye health, and even your skin health, right? So blueberries are an amazing um, tasty food, of course, and also very high in antioxidants. And a little tip I always give is in the seeds of berries, we often don't take the time to really think about what we're eating. And the seeds in the blueberry are so tiny, but they're filled with oil. So most berries seeds are filled with oil and that's where a lot of the antioxidants lay and the properties that are really healthy for us and when i make skincare i use the berry seed oils as a topical but if we're ingesting it it's also really good for us so um, you can actually get berry seed oil or berry seed oil capsules and put that directly on your skin as a as a way to really nourish your skin in a natural way and for pennies, not $90 eye cream, but pennies for um, blueberry seed oil capsules. And they're just amazing for the skin. Um, dried berries, of course, been used for, for centuries in indigenous communities for a food source and uh, in pemmican and just... Um, dried berries on their own just as a way to sustain people especially through the winter so yeah blueberries are are amazing okay next one uh, this one was new for me to use in in my work and i never used elderberry until um, the beginning of the pandemic and i had a lot of requests for people um, from people asking me for elderberry so i didn't know a lot about it um, what I did learn is it grows really fast, which is great, just like a willow grows really fast. And it's, it has so many amazing properties. And some of them are like that anti-inflammatory um, uh, property, which is really good, high in vitamin C. And then I found out people were making a syrup with this as a cough syrup and as a way to increase their immune system. So... I guess that was the interest during uh, a season or a time in our, our lives when we're, you know, fighting illness and trying to have a really strong immune system. So uh, if you're interested afterwards, and I'll provide my email, we can certainly send some recipes out uh, to you. This one in particular is, is a great cough syrup and um, immune building syrup. And great as a tea as well, just as a high in vitamin C anti-inflammatory tea. Okay, uh, horsetail is super common, I know, in Alberta. Um, it tends to grow in areas that are really damp. We used to get a lot of it in our ditches when we lived on the acreage. And so a very uh, annoying weed for the farmers. They fight it and battle it, but it is quite an amazing plant and I've heard it referred to as the beauty secret plant. Um, it's high in absorbable calcium, uh, silica, which is really good for your hair and your nails. And um, we used to make a hair rinse with this. So by taking this plant and boiling it, like um, simmering it in a, in a pan and making a really nice dark green infusion, if you put that into a spray bottle and spray it directly onto your hair, it makes your hair naturally shiny because of the silica in there. So, and it's healthy for your hair, so better than chemicals. So quite an incredible plant. Um, it is, it uh, was a prehistoric, in prehistoric times, I guess I should say, it would grow like enormous. It was a giant food and, or a giant, almost a tree. And over time and evolution, it's 
you know, goes to maybe two or three feet. And um, you can buy serums with it in it. Um, I've seen uh, shampoos that have horsetail in it to prevent hair loss. So again, this is one of those plants that you can pick early in the summer and dry it and have it for the year. Make your tea, make your hair rinse, um, lots of great properties in this plant. Okay, this is our um, muskeg tea, Labrador tea. And I see this growing in the muskeg areas, right? Usually under spruce trees and where you see a lot of moss and it's moist. You'll often see this tea growing. And this is one of those that you have to really know what you're picking because there's a plant that grows near it that has white on the back and that one is toxic. This one has that nice rusty orange color on the back. And it is a really good tea for promoting relaxation and rest. Um, we didn't know why all the adults would give us this when we were camping, us kids. Um, we thought it was just a treat at night, but I guess they had a, a motive to get us to bed and us kids to sleep. And I've tried it on my own kids and it actually does work. So. Um, Treatment for colds, for fevers. Uh, we used it in our tea blend to help with cleaning the blood and the liver. And it, this uh, has also been used externally to treat skin conditions. So making a salve with the extract can really help with things like eczema and psoriasis. So it's, it's another plant with so many properties, but um, that real rest and relaxation, it's, it's a great one for that. Okay, raspberry leaf. Um, this is becoming pretty mainstream, I find, as far as becoming the tea that everyone knows to use during pregnancy um, last trimester. And again, this is not medical advice. Always check with your doctor. But um, I know a lot of people, myself included, that used this. I used it in all three of my pregnancies. And um, it really helps shorten labor and delivery time. It strengthens the uterus. So, um, and then on top of that, it helps to, with a strengthened uterus, childbirth becomes easier and it also increases your milk production after the baby's born, helps tone the uterus back up after the baby's born. So uh, such an amazing women's plant. It's, um, you know, just, just the leaves, and we're talking about just the leaves. And then, of course, there's the berries, which are tasty and full of the wonderful seed oils in those seeds. So really a great woman's tea. We often mixed it with sage to become a really amazing women's tea. So the two, the two together were such a, are such a nice blend. Um, I think our next slide is sage. If we can go to that one. There it is. Okay. So yeah, this is our sage and sage being the woman's plant. Um, it helps to balance the hormones. So mixing that last one raspberry leaf with sage is just a wonderful combination for PMS, um, even menopause, hot flashes, just a great tea. And on top of it, sage is really good for uh, throat infections. I've seen people gargle with it when they have a throat infection, uh, swish around their mouth for dental abscesses or gum issues. And um, we, I use it a lot in my skincare products because it is that antibacterial. So it's so, um, another one that's so broad in properties. Um, but it's interesting that we use it as a cleansing smudge and we know now scientifically that it's antibacterial so that when we, of course, smudge with sage, it's to cleanse and purify. So it's really an all around cleansing plant. And um, I, I often will make cleaning products at home with that one. So to put in your, your floor wash, right? Put in some sage, drops of sage oil, maybe some lavender oil. It's just a nice, antibacterial cleansing plant. And it does taste really good with as a tea, if you haven't had it as a tea. Okay, next one. 
Uh, nettle is um, such an amazing plant. It grows, I, I've seen this grow like six feet tall and it comes back early in the spring. So one of the first plants back. So um, it used to be used as a spring tonic plant. And because it's loaded with protein and iron, um, after a long hard winter, this was a plant that people could use to increase their vitamin levels to, um, you can put the leaves into soups and stews. Um, they, once, once they're dried or cooked, the sting is gone. I have a lot of people ask me that. Um, so yeah, into soups and stews for um, increased vitamin and mineral. If you're low on iron, um, naturopaths, I see them quite often prescribe like a tincture of stinging nettle. Um, it is good for relieving high blood pressure. Um, this, I guess, if we have any plants that we talk about in this presentation is we've got the women's plants being sage and raspberry leaf. This one could be seen as one of uh, a good plant for men. I have a lot of men buy this. It helps with um, prostate health. So a good men's plant. And another one that can be used in a hair rinse to help with hair loss. So very good properties for hair loss in this plant. So. Okay. Wild mint. This is, this is the plant that actually inspired me to start my business. And it was a, a plant that I had in my classroom. So when I was teaching, um, I would quite often, because I taught foods, I taught health, I taught career and life management, we had a lot of flexibility in what, what I could use in my curriculum. So working in an Indigenous high school with gardens of Indigenous plants, I would bring them into the classroom. And this was one of the plants that I remember bringing in and I was talking to the students about it and I was passing around the jar with the dried wild mint in it. And I had one student who always would um, sit in the back of the class with his hat down and his headphones on and just not interested in being in school at all and never spoke to me once. He just came, did his thing, sat in the back and um, we didn't have a connection. And the day that I had the wild mint and I passed it underneath his nose so he could smell it, it was the first time he looked up at me and he, he looked in my eyes and he got these big tears in his eyes. And um, he, he was quite choked up and he said, my cook I'm used to give me that when, when I was sick. And that moment for me was, how can I connect that way with more students? And not so much me connecting with them, but finding a way to connect them back to their communities and become interested in um, learning from their elders and their medicine people, because I saw the knowledge really being lost. So for me, I wanted, you know, my brain was just going like, how can I create um, an opportunity for students to connect that way? And um, that was sort of the whole beginning of my business, really. Um, to find a way to get it out to more people and in, inspire or uh, find a way to get them interested and excited. And uh, the students generally really loved working with the plants. Um, it, it was fun, it was better than just lecturing, right? So they could get their hands dirty and get in the garden, they could touch the plants, smell them, and that's really healing, I think. So, but it was this one that really kind of began that journey for me. And it is such an amazing plant. It grows, again, I know all over Alberta, in the north, in the west, and usually in really damp uh, areas near a body of water. You can typically smell it before you even find it. So you walk into an area and it's, the smell is overpowering. And this is a plant that is great to promote relaxation. It's good for typical, the things that typical mint are good for, like coughs and colds and upset stomach. Um, not one to be taken during pregnancy. So this is another example of really knowing what you're taking or what you're picking, that during pregnancy, um, this one can actually cause premature labor. 
So just again, being, being safe and careful with what you're taking or are offering to people. But a beautiful plant. I love this one. Okay. Uh, willow bark, another amazing plant and so abundant in Alberta. This plant, um, I guess we can think of it as our aspirin, our natural aspirin. And it contains salicin, which is similar to the ingredient in aspirin. So because of that, it's known for pain relieving, headaches, but especially um, arthritic pain because it helps to reduce inflammation. So if you have swollen joints, um, arthritis pain, this is a beautiful plant to incorporate into your daily routine um, if you're not sensitive to aspirin. Because if you were sensitive to aspirin, then this wouldn't be a good choice. But um, I like to mix this one with the wild mint because the two work really well together for helping with inflammation and pain. And if you want inflammation, pain relief, and sleep, then I would mix willow bark, wild mint, and the muskeg Labrador tea. Those three together are just a beautiful, they will make you sleep, they will help with your pain and your inflammation right away. So it's such a nice tea to take at bedtime. And uh, willow, again, um, Picking this one is easy, a couple small branches, and I just use a vegetable peeler to peel off that willow bark and let it dry. You can use it fresh or you can dry it to have it through the year. Um, another good thing to do with willow bark is to use it in your skincare. So my skincare line had a base with a lot of willow bark. And the reason I did that was because it, it acts like if anyone's been to the spa and paid you know, 90 or $100 to get a, a chemical peel of some kind. I'm, this is, I'm talking the milder kind, but like a glycolic peel or something that helps to break down the dead skin. Um, I don't like paying $90 to get that done at the spa. So this came out of me being frugal. But by taking a willow, a strong willow tea, you can apply that to your skin and it will do a couple things. It will help. Uh, with the dead skin cells to take the dead skin and brighten your skin. But it will also help with any inflammation in your skin. So if, if someone has acne and has a lot of red inflamed areas on their skin, this will not only reduce that, it will reduce the fine lines, the dead skin on your skin. So you can make a wonderful toner with this to apply every day, just a mild, nice, um, toner of willow bark to help with acne, fine lines and wrinkles, brightening your skin. So it's another one. You can drink it, you can apply it to your skin. And we add this to the Mother Earth Essentials uh, lotions. We put it right in there. So every time you apply it, then it's helping with skin brightening. So it's a nice one. Okay, next one. Okay, this is yarrow. And a lot of people have, um, seen this growing another one that grows sort of on the side of the road or by the sidewalks in the city one of the weeds that we all try to pull and get rid of but it's actually quite an amazing plant as well um, really good for digestion so there's a lot of properties here but this one can help stimulate your digestion um, you can use the entire plant um, there is some research going on for treatment of diabetes um, fresh leaves on the skin uh, to keep mosquitoes away. And the flowers themselves are um, quite, you, know, it, you need a lot of them. If you can get a lot of flowers, they take these flowers and they either cold press or steam extract the oil. And the oil from those white flowers is actually quite a dark blue, almost inky color. And it is absolutely amazing for eczema. So that's an amazing eczema treatment. The oil is very expensive to buy. I learned that. I think at one point we were paying $1,000 for a liter of that oil or more. So it's quite a precious oil, but extremely effective for skin conditions. Um, traditionally, we would see people take this and actually chew it up. If someone had a 
a wasp bite uh, or an insect sting. So to chew it up and make almost a, a poultice or a paste with it and apply it to an insect bite to help draw out the poison. Um, yeah, it's used, this one is pretty common and it's used in a lot of different countries. Um, in Europe, I heard for stopping bleeding too. So a poultice again, if someone was had a lot of bleeding, it would stop bleeding. So many properties to this weed that everyone wants to pull out of their gardens and yards. Okay, so I rushed through those. I rushed through all those and I know it's, it's a lot and I know it's fast. Um, we're trying to do this all in an hour. Um, and at this point, what we would normally be doing is we would all be standing up and stretching our legs and bringing our little bags to make our own little tea to take home. But um, we're using our imagination. So you have your tea and you would just make it like you would make any herbal tea by putting a teaspoon of your plant mixture into a cup of boiled water. And um, that's pretty much the, the way most of them are used. Some of them we will boil longer, um, sometimes willow or horsetail. So I've really just been able in, in this presentation about plants to touch on the very, very basics of this stuff. And I know there is a great deal more. And I would love to take some time here to answer any questions that we can. Um, I think there might be another slide, I don't know. Um, one more. Okay, so I've just uh, finished this book. Um, it's a book of recipes on some different tea blends um, and more information on the plants and some of their properties, more plants as well. Um, and also contains recipes on skincare and making salves and lotions and, and things like that. So it's been an exciting venture. It took me a while. I, I had a lot to learn about writing, that's for sure. And um, we finally published it and we've just launched this Kickstarter. So if you're interested in um, learning more about the teas or the plants, feel free to check that out. I believe it should be printed at the end of November. So I've put a number of recipes in that book. So there, there's some in there. But if, um, if there's questions for now, I think we have about 15 minutes left and we can, we can take questions. Hopefully there will be some. Thank you, Carrie. Um, I know there's been a few different questions. The chat room is going. Uh, before we get into the questions, I want to just acknowledge you for this beautiful presentation and it makes me think about how you've presented in these, although you said superficial, you still held the multiple realities of this work, that connection to the land, that connection to grandmothers, uh, that connection to identity, and that connection to stories and the healing elements. So even though it was a short time, I feel that you uh, were able to, in this beautiful way, and, and give the properties and the knowledge of this depth of knowledge of these plants. And I know that um, I have your whole bundle of your products and I was always so excited when I received them 10 years ago, even maybe before, and that you've able to come into the mainstream but still maintain grounded. So I want to salute you and acknowledge you for the courage of that work because it's, it's big work. It's significant work. Thank you. And um, so just, um, yeah, a big salute to you for all of that and looking forward to receiving your book i've already placed my copy so encourage everyone to to check out uh carrie's kickstart and put in your order of your book so yes we have a couple time for maybe 15 minutes for questions um mara's going to be sending me some but i do have two here one is in regards to seasonally when would you say would be the best time to gather or harvest uh, plants and herbs and maybe even if we want to plant them or or how if you could speak to that process of of timing seasonally oh boy that's an entire book because every single plant is different and for instance uh, when we look at the raspberry leaf 
you can pick it through the summer, but it is said never to pick that after there's been a frost because it becomes toxic. So that's one teaching of one plant. Um, an elder once told me with willow bark that it gets stronger. And uh, so it's milder earlier in the spring. And then as time goes on, it gets stronger. So that would be one where it would really depend how strong do you want it, right? So you might want it just mild, you pick it earlier. And then as the seasons go on, it becomes stronger. So um, it's, we can't really just bulk them all together and say what time is best to harvest them. And it also depends where you live and the, the climate. So, you know, at the beginning, we talked about um, to really learn this and connecting with a medicine person to really understand where you are, your area, um, uh, the safety tips around the plant in your areas. Um, there's some amazing books out there. Um, the people that are working to publish my, that have published my book is called Lone Pine Press. And you've probably seen their books around. There's one book called Edible and Medicinal Plants of the Rockies that they sell. And it is, they've done a beautiful job of talking about the specific dangers of each plant um, and things to consider when you're picking. But it still doesn't get into those teachings of um, that our medicine people can teach us. So I, I'm, I'm hoping, and I think since the beginning, I've hoped since the beginning I started the business was to find ways to um, really um, ensure that that knowledge gets carried on in families, in communities, because it is being lost. And it's those subtle, subtle teachings that you can't necessarily read about in a book or, or teach in a workshop like this, because there's so many things to consider. So I know that's a horrible answer. It's not answering the question, but it's, um, no, I think it's a good answer because you bring in, it's a perfect answer because you're bringing in the intelligence of the plants also and the complexities and also the spiritual aspect of, of the plants, right? And that within that whole process, like even just going to pick making that offering, but you need to know your environment that you're living in, right? Yeah. And that's about a relationship to the land and to the space. So it's, it's part, of, part of your bundle that you're bringing that's, that's so important because it's about lifting us up also as indigenous people and as indigenous women um, and bringing us closer to how to be good relatives also. Yes. And that's part of that learning process. And I love how you speak about at the beginning, you talked about your mistakes and, and that journey. And I, I wrote down, it's like that journey of humility. And those plants really ask of that of us also. Yeah. So I just want to um, add that to that, to this conversation. There's one other question um, here that in terms of the specifics of, let's say, the horse tails or even the sage, because there's different varieties, right? Yes. So let's, well, can you speak to a little bit about the, the, the this different species of horsetails? Um, I don't know if I have a whole lot of knowledge on the different species and Latin names. Um, I, I really am not a, a botanist. Um, I do know this. There are many kinds of sage. There are many kinds of willow, um, many kinds of clover different plants, right, have different varieties. But they typically have a common thread, you know, willow, willow contains salicin, whether it's white willow or red willow. Um, as far as I know, horsetail contains silica and selenium and is really good for hair, skin and nails. Um, again, these are, are questions that, um, you know, not being a, uh, an expert in mainstream plants, I'm sharing teachings from my family and I don't 
necessarily know all of those um, those kinds of teachings, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, that, that makes... You know, I feel like I'm not answering any questions here. No, somehow. no, it's good. <laughs> questions are sometimes lead to other questions, not always about having to, just helps us to think through, think through some of these uh, reflections on your presentation. There's a lot of times when I do a presentation, there's, there are people in the room or, or in a presentation like this that probably know, um, you know, the field of botany way better than I ever will, you know, that science based stuff. Um, so I, I speak from a, a place of sharing my teachings and, and learning along the way. And, you know, also the, the cosmetic world enters in a little bit too, when I'm talking about skincare and things like that. Um, yeah. Well, that's the richness of what you're bringing, the teachings that come from your own re relations and what worked in that context and remembering what you were given as a little girl or helping, you know, that's so, that's just in of itself is significant. So uh, I want to, again, kind of acknowledge that the capacity to bring that to us today with hundreds of people uh, through this technology. And it's for sure, you know, the ability to smell them and to touch and to changes the entire dynamics. So thanks Absolutely. for yeah. being flexible and doing this uh, land-based really learning and wellness through this kind of technology. Um, I have uh, one more question here is something about when about the sage does something change when we cook it or heat it does it change its properties it probably changes its chemical properties um, I don't see how it couldn't now when we're making tea um, and we bring the water to you know there there is probably a perfect temperature to really release the the most benefits from the um, from the leaves of the plant um, so things do change for change for sure um, even the essential oils if they extract sage oil uh, by using a steam distillation process versus cold pressing I, i'm sure the chemical compound would slightly alter um, but I think the predominant healing properties remain pretty much intact if you are doing it in a, a way that is um, careful and not damaging it. I mean, I suppose if you boiled something, it's like when we freeze a vegetable, right? It does lose some of its properties, right? It's just the way plants are. So um, absolutely. Um, sage in itself i can't speak to exactly chemically what happens when it's frozen dried boiled um, made into an oil but yes of course things do change when they're altered other than using fresh and i mean if we could all use fresh picked off the plant every day that would be amazing and um, but it's just not typically not possible for most of us so no, that's a good, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I love that in your presentation, you've included the language that reflect the language in, in, in the language, in, in your language. Can you yeah. speak to us a little bit about that, the importance, you know, why that was important to you and what the significance of giving um, the names back in the language to the plants that you shared with us and that they've shared with us also right so um many languages but i i chose cree um because that is my background and um just really wanted to uh, language along with teachings it are it's being lost right so we're losing those language teachers and there's been such an amazing resurgence in in interest and people taking indigenous language classes that I think that's super exciting and um, I think traditional knowledge is starting to follow along right where we're we're teaching these things we're talking about them and um, yeah so I just thought it really important to 
to honor, um, I guess, my family, my teachings. Um, you always see the Latin name, right? You open a plant book and the Latin name is always right there. Yeah, I love, yeah. And yeah, which, you know, I guess, but it was time to start, let's put, let's put the indigenous name because that's where we are and that's where we're standing in this country. And I wanted to make sure that that was there. Yeah, that's a really beautiful element and important part. And I'm sure we'll see that in your book also. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Because it's like honoring the spirit of the language and the spirit of the plant. Yes. And again, that relationship and those instructions that would come through, through the language. Yeah. One, we'll have, I think, one last question. And it's just kind of like this practical question that someone posted. And I appreciate it also because I've been also, you know, back uh, picking some sage and picking different medicines is a little bit that I'm learning through your work and through the elders in my own community. And, and I think about the harvest process, you know, sometimes I'm hanging them to, to dry in different places, or do I leave them on the ground? And so what would be a good way to, to harvest uh, and to dry um, the medicines that we are gathering? How do you do it? Okay, well, uh, a couple different ways, um, depending. Um, hanging to dry is is a great option, um, and it looks pretty and it smells great. Um, just out of the sunlight, so keeping it out of the sun. Um, so in a in a dry place, but not a sunny place. Um, when we do big batches, so when I'm making a big tea blend or you know using our teas, we do it in a kiln. So it dries it at the right temperature and dries it completely because there's nothing worse than partially drying something, putting it in a sealed container and then it, it rots. So really making sure it's very dry. Um, things like rose hips, like right now, if, if yeah. everyone could just leave work today and go out and harvest rose hips, um, it's a perfect time to pick them. And those ones I just would lay out on a towel or a cloth and just let them dry and have them for the year. Um, amazing, high in vitamin C, so you could have those all year round. Um, Do you make teas? How would you use the rose hip? The I rose hips? Some people make jelly, okay. right? So they make uh, fresh jelly, but yes, tea. And again, the, the rose hip seeds, if you can find a way, you need lots and lots of seeds, but if you can find a way to com you know, compact those seeds and extract the oil, amazing amazing oil so beautiful for your skin but um yeah you can just simmer those right because you really want when you make a tea that's one of the plants that you wouldn't just scoop into a cup and pour water because you're not going to release anything so i always find i just put them at a really just before boil, boiling point and put them in the water for about you know 10 15 minutes three of those rose hips have the same vitamin C content as an entire orange. Wow. So, so just the, the rose hip, the, the berry? Yeah. Or the leaves, just the berry. Okay. The berry. So, um, okay, I'm going off a tangent of a plant again, but so many ways to dry, but yeah, out of the sun. Uh, my grandma would have said, never put it in plastic. Okay. Um, because it, it leaches. She didn't know then what was happening, but she she instinctively knew plastic wasn't a good thing. So um, uh, paper bags or a glass jar. Um, paper bags is good if you, you want to make sure they're super dry, right? If you put it in a jar and seal it and it's not dry or any moisture in there, um, then it's going to not, it's going to be rotting on you. But, and how long to dry do you, would you say? Oh, again, depends totally on the plant. Like some rose hips specifically oh the rose hips they take they take a while okay. like i've had rose hips on my counter now for almost three weeks okay they're not dry yet they're not dry okay so don't be in a hurry for that cup of no. tea after no, well, and you could use them fresh too though right but just if if someone wanted to have a supply for the entire year and they wanted to right. pick and dry a whole bunch and put them you know store them for the winter that's certainly, uh, when you say they're sitting on your uh, counter for three weeks, plants should teach us about patience, I would have to yeah. say. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I want to again uh, thank you so much, Merci, Carrie, for being with us today. There's a lot more questions and reflections, and I love that people are helping each other on the chat. So good job, everyone who's uh, helping one another and answering questions for yourselves and for each other. And one last uh, acknowledgement of your fantastic book that we get to uh, soon have a copy on our uh, kitchen tables. And where can you tell us when and where we can buy uh, your book? Where can we find you? And, and well, I uh, that is yet to be seen exactly where. I will be having it on my uh, a Sky Tea website for sure. Um, and I'm told that it will be done by the end of November. So um, it's been a long wait. And just um, on that topic, the front cover art, I don't know if you had a good look at that. And it's just a beautiful image that was um, created by Christy Belcourt. And Christy Belcourt, um, my grandma was a Belcourt. And there's a link there in the family. I'm not sure exactly how. So I've always been a huge fan of her work because, of course, she talks about the medicines, the plants. And even more so, this painting is called She Who Stands Tall. Mm -hmm. representing that one in the middle and that really spoke to me because um, I've had a lot of um, you know over the last while the last 10 years a lot of um, my own trauma that I've had to live through and coming back and getting strong again and that image of she who stands tall was just such a perfect image for this book and the lady who commissioned Christy uh, allowed me to use this. So I just want to just say that publicly that mm -hmm. what a gift to have that beautiful artwork for me to look at. So mm. that is beautiful. Yeah. Well, I, um, you, you are an inspiration to many of us. And so I appreciate you sharing your journey and, and really standing tall that allows all of us uh, to stand tall together. You know, so hi, hi. And, uh, Again, merci for everything. Thank you for everyone who's been online today. We could probably spend all day with Carrie, uh, but thanks for taking the time to be with us. Look for our next um, topics on the Sustainability Council and check out, keep an eye on Carrie's book that's soon be coming. Check out her Kickstart and her website and um, continue to be good to ourselves, good relatives to our plants and to each other and to all that's around us during these times. So, hi, hi. Thank you.